I'll give him a round of applause here as he makes his way. Come on. Thank you. Bow with me, please. Lord, we thank you for the day. We thank you for the time together. We thank you for the meal and FCA, what they mean to this area and this community. We thank you for the blessing um, on my life and our coaches in the area just continuing to pour into us. Speak into these coaches and uh, have your will be done tonight. Bless this food. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Coach. Appreciate it. Hey, so next I want to bring Angel Turnbow up here. So some of you may know um, her story. Some of you saw her story. Some of you may not, but... Uh, I wanted to, her to come up here and share a little bit of her testimony of just what recently, a few months ago, she was, was hit by a car on a bicycle. And so she, well, two months ago, did I say two weeks? I'm sorry, two months. Um, yeah, and so just a miracle that she's standing here right now is the whole, whole but she'll share a little bit of her story. See, I'll give her a round of applause for that. I really am only up here because I just want to say thank you to this entire community because you talk about prayer working. God is good because I know he is the only reason that I'm standing up here talking to you. I went back to school, I guess, two Wednesdays, two Wednesdays ago, and I think I'm at eight weeks, at the eight-week mark this week, and ran this morning two miles at nine minute pace, <laughs> and y'all don't know, I'm a, I'm a Boston Marathon runner and a former collegiate Louisiana Tech D1 track runner, and all I cared about was I got to be able to use these legs and run, <laughs> so that was a big thing to me, but 12 broken bones and a collapsed lung and two punctured arteries later, God is so good, and I think I'm going to be 100% and not even know this this time next year. And I just have to give all the credit to him, and I just want to say thank you, seriously. I had no, I had the whole community praying because I felt the prayers. I told my husband, Daniel, every day, I said, babe, I can feel the prayers working. I just felt like I was getting better. And I know a lot of you, and I just love you, and I'm just happy to be here. And I want to say one more thing. If you ever get down and you're like, you know, gosh, I got to go to school today, I don't think I'm ever going to think those words again because I've sent it to my husband and my principal this week already. And I said, you know what? I am fired up to be going to school today. I could not be more excited. It just makes you really happy to be here. But love you guys. Thanks for sharing that. Thank you. Awesome. Amazing. Amazing. Thanks for sharing that. Um, so here next, um, we're going to bring up Sherman Smith. So Sherman, he played nine years in the NFL. He coached 22 years in the NFL, coached high school and college as well. Um, and just uh, an amazing story. He'll, I'm sure he'll share a little bit with you, but also just an incredible man of God, just being able to hang around him and spend time with him, just impressed. And it's just a treat to be able to bring him to our area, for him to be able to come speak to y'all tonight, but also to the banquet uh, tomorrow night. So y'all give a round of applause for Sherman Smith tonight. All right. How's everybody doing? Well, it's good to see you guys. Thanks for having us here, Terry, Hayden, allowing us to be a part of this. Haley, been having fun hanging out with Haley here. It's been a good time. You know, just being here tonight with you is no doubt it's a blessing. And you know, I, I never think anything is an accident. I never, I don't think we're here by accident. I truly believe in the sovereignty of God and in eternity past. God knew that tonight we would be here tonight. And as Terry organized this thing, I, I say we never, um, we don't make spiritual appointments, we keep them. And I truly believe tonight we are keeping a spiritual appointment. It was anointed, set up by God, appointed by God, and that's why we're here tonight. And so I just pray as God has spoke, even through the testimony that we got there, word of encouragement, that you can get something out of here, you get something here tonight. I always say this whenever I speak, and I'm going to bring my wife up here in a minute so she can get ready. I always say this when I speak, you know, for me, being a coach, having coached, having played football, I was a quarterback in college, quarterback in high school, and I always say when I look at us as we get together here tonight, it's like 
being in the huddle. And I use this illustration all the time. And you coaches know what I'm talking about. So to me, I look at us tonight that we're, we're in a huddle. If I speak at a, a church group, I say, I'm speaking to Team Jesus tonight. I remember I was telling, I was talking about I spoke at a church in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, and uh, a couple years ago, and this pastor, he said, hey, um, you're not coaching anymore, are you? And I said, uh, well, I had my hat off, and I put my hat on, and I said, well, I'm getting ready to coach at your church this morning. And so that's where I feel God has called me. I'm still coaching. It's just not coaching X's and O's, but coaching and talking to God's children. So as we get together tonight in this huddle, I want you to understand the purpose of a huddle. You get encouraged in the huddle. When I was a quarterback, I would encourage guys in the huddle. Give them a word. Come on, man. Do it. Keep up the good work. You get challenged in the huddle. Come on, man. We got to stop them right here. They can't go any further. You get a word of warning in the huddle. Hey, Watch this, watch that. Be careful. Here's when they like to do that. And then you get a word of instruction in the huddle. It's interesting to me as you read God's word, those are four things God says is supposed to happen in the church amongst believers. He says, encourage them, exhort them, warn them, and instruct them. So that's the word that I want, we come to the huddle tonight, that you get encouraged, challenged, warned, and instructed. And the thing is, is when you leave here tonight, you're supposed to leave here differently than the way you came in. That's the purpose of the huddle. You leave differently than the way you came in. And a physical illustration is like you came in those doors there, and you're going to go out those doors over there. You go out differently than the way you came in. That's the goal. That's the desire. But also when you break the huddle, you know, we don't stay in the huddle because we know the battle is not in the huddle. The battle isn't in here. So we're going to break the huddle. And when we break the huddle, the big important thing is we must apply what we got in the huddle. It's all about application. I'd always say that information without application is in subordination in the life of a Christian, resulting in no transformation. But transformation is an indication of the application of the information, resulting in transformation. So we got to do that. We got to be about application. Now, there's one thing I say. There's knowing and learning, and it's all about application. There's a difference between knowing and learning. We all know a lot, but until we apply it, we haven't learned anything. See, we all know a lot, but until you put it into practice, you really haven't learned anything. And so that's what we're supposed to do here tonight. Man, hopefully you get something that you will apply. And you can say, I know that. How do I know it? Because I've applied that truth. And if you hear something that you get and you don't apply it, that means you don't believe it. So I just want to encourage us as a body of believers, as coaches tonight, because after my wife comes up, she's going to come up and she wants to say something and encourage and pray for the spouses of, of the coaches. And then I'm going to come up and give a word of encouragement to our coaches, challenge, to believers. I'm, I'm speaking to the body of Christ, to those who are in Christ tonight. Coaches, if you're not, whoever, if you're not in Christ, that's fine, but I'm gonna speak to believers, coaches, wives. It's a message for everybody tonight, okay? So I'm gonna have my bride come up here real quick. Uh, my bride, Sharon. And um, you, like I say, you know the story. If you know the story about, go, there you come. You know, the story, the story about me finding out uh, seven years ago that I had a son, Dylan, and um, man, I was going through it when I found out that day, and man, I was not, I tell the story, I wasn't feeling real good about it, I felt bad when Dylan called and said, hey, you know, I found out from my mom that you're my dad, and I felt bad about it, and it, I wasn't feeling bad about Dylan, I was feeling bad about the situation, because I know the relationship that I had with my dad, and we had a great relationship, and I felt guilty because of my irresponsibility, Dylan didn't get to experience what I experienced. And so I was going through a guilt phase, feeling real bad about myself. So that night, I didn't think I was gonna tell my wife about it until after Dylan and I did a DNA test, but I told my wife that night, and her response was one that a lot of people can't believe it. And so that's why I say I know that how God spoke through her and continues to speak through her. And, you know, her response was, after I told her that, 
she didn't jump on me, you know, because, you know, there was no timetable that, you know, Dylan was born when she and I were in a relationship. Heck, she was a junior in high school in Cleveland. I was a senior in high school in Youngstown, so we didn't even know each other. But her response was, our family just got bigger, and I want to go meet my grandkids and my daughter-in-law. And she loves those kids, those grandboys of ours, like they are hers. If you tell her they're not, you better get ready to fight. But she's been the spouse that's been with me in 32 years of coaching. The strength, you know, I can just tell you, I've got one. That's why I want her to say something to you tonight, because she did a great job of allowing me to do what God has called me to do. So here you go, man. Okay. <clears throat> Sherman kind of gave me a curveball. I didn't know he was going to quite say anything about dealing in that whole situation. But just to continue, um, and most of you guys, I think, have heard the story. But Sherman fathered a child when he was in high school, and the mom never told Sherman she was pregnant. And so people always ask us, well, you look alike, you do this, why didn't you know? And he had no idea. He never knew that there was a child. Um, the mom's child decided to put the baby up for adoption, and so Sherman was never told at all, so he never knew anything about it. But as... Um, he tells the story, I want all of you guys to think about what you do every day as coaches and what you do for your kids. Sherman and most of the um, coach running back and most of his position players, he became really, really close with. And so there's been a lot of kids in his life throughout the years, but he's pretty much had a, co a personal connection with every single one of them. And so when the story of Dylan came out, Sherman started talking to me about Dylan, and I was kind of thinking back, and even though Dylan wasn't around us, throughout the years, he would talk about Dylan. Dylan broke a rushing record this year, or Dylan didn't get drafted, but Dylan signed a contract as a free agent. So he kind of always followed these guys throughout their entire lives, and it was just something kind of special to see. So remember as you're coaching these kids that they're people too just like you, and they're worth your time, and they're worth the investment, because you never know who they're going to grow up to be. Um, when Sherman told me about Dylan, people are kind of surprised about my reaction, but I knew Dylan, of course, as a player, and I, 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 my heart went out to him immediately when Sherman told me that I wondered what it felt like for him to be adopted and to grow up not knowing your connections and your biological family. And so when Dylan was introduced, or telling us about um, Sherman was his dad, there was never any negative feelings in my heart, and I really wanted him and Sherman to have a connection because I felt all he was asking for was time with his dad, and that wasn't at all too much to ask for. So anyway, I was calm, I was relaxed, and I knew that was God, and I just welcomed him with open arms. And so our family went from, I don't know, our two kids and our grandkids. Dylan has a large family. He has four kids, and he has his wife. So anyway, our numbers kind of increase. And now when we all get together, there's 14 of us, and we just have a great time. <clears throat> what I, though, actually, when Sherman asked me to encourage you guys, what I wanted to talk to was some of the spouses in here with coaching and the moving around and everything that's involved in that, and sometimes that can be a lonely, lonely experience. And I wanted to encourage you all, especially the ladies of the coaches, to not feel like you're on an island all by yourself and to reach out to your community. And when I think about the 20 plus, 30 plus years that Sherman's coached, I think about we've, all the different people I've met. We've lived in seven different states, and we lived in about 13 or 14 different houses. And it's kind of nice to go around the country, because a lot of times when we go somewhere, it's a place where I happen to know someone. 
Um, but I really want to encourage you guys to develop community, to develop relationships, and become a close-knit group because you guys really, really need each other and you need to depend on each other. Um, there was so great for me that sometimes things was going on at work and I couldn't get off to get the kids and I could call somebody and ask them, can you pick up the kids or can the kids stay with you? I have to do this. And it was just always encouraging for me and the friends that I had. And it was also great for our kids to get to meet so many people and to be close with a lot of different people and to really get to know the families in detail. When I um, thought about this, I was trying to think of some type of a scripture that I could give you guys about the importance of community and relationships. And the one that I came up with is in Ecclesiastes 4, verses 9 and 10. And a lot of people use this for their wedding verse, but I also just think it um, is a good verse for communities and relationships. And what it says is two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up, but pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. So again, just want you guys to always remember that there's someone in their group, in your group, please reach out to them and please um, try to make a connection with them. I just want to pray for the spouses in here tonight, the coaches in here tonight, and the whole community situation because I don't want you to feel like you're lonely or not seen or not appreciated because you all are very, very important. And those kids love you guys and really, really um, know and understand the investment that you make in each and every one of them. If you guys could just bow your head. I'm going to just say a quick prayer. Heavenly Father, we just come to you tonight and just giving thanks to you for all the people that are in this room and for all the different lives and connections that we have. I ask you to be with each and every one of them, to touch their hearts, to touch their minds, dear Father God, and just give them that feeling of belonging and connection as they are um, sometimes all alone and sometimes busy and sometimes overwhelmed, dear Father God. I want you to give them that peace that surpasses all understanding and let them know that they're seen, that they're important, and that what they're doing is for you, dear Father God, and that those kids receive the benefit of that. It's in your son Jesus Christ's name. I just want to say thank you for that. And amen. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you. Well, I thank you. I'm talking to a group of difference makers. Because parents, teachers, and coaches can have the greatest impact on young kids today. And you're difference makers. But I will say to our coaches and their spouses, when we talk about being a team, I hope you recognize that you and your wife are a team. That you're a team. What is a team? They have shared goals, a shared mindset. And it's funny, I was doing a marriage class in our church, and I made that, put that question out to the people in the class. I said, do you realize that you and your husband and your wife, that you guys are a team? And how many people did not see it that way? But you are a team. So let me tell you this, and you think about it. When you think about being on a team and you think about a good teammate, there's some characteristics you think about that make up a good teammate. And then when you think about a bad teammate, you think about the characteristics that make up a bad teammate. So the question that I would have for you guys is, are you a good teammate or are you a bad teammate with your husband, with your wife? Are you a good teammate or bad teammate? You know, in our marriage class, we talked about that we recognize, Sharon and I recognize that neither one of us, of us are perfect, but we recognize we're perfect for each other. And as you look at your bride, your husband, say, he's not perfect, she's not perfect, but we're perfect for each other. Tony Evans gave us some great marriage counseling. My wife and I have been married now going on 48 years, and he gave us some great marriage counseling that I really believe saved our marriage 
probably the first couple years of marriage, because we were always making a big deal out of how different we were. Well, you're different than me. You're different than me. You this, you that. And so I called Doc Evans, who was a friend, teacher, and he said, you know what? Your differences are meant to be a compliment. They're not meant to cause conflict. He said, if both of you were the same, one of you would be unnecessary. If both of you were the same, one of you would be unnecessary. So he said, your differences are meant to be a compliment. It's not meant to cause conflict. So I just want to encourage you along those lines as you look at your wife and your husband, that you guys recognize that you are a team. You have shared goals, and you should have a shared mindset about what you want to do, and that you're a team. That you're a team. You must communicate. And so everyone's role is important. If the husband's role, if he's the coach or the wife's the coach, the spouse, your role is important. I know Sharon's role was important in our marriage when I was coaching and still is important, you know, I'm not coaching. And then the role that I had as a coach. So I just want you to recognize if you're sitting here with your bride tonight, you are sitting with your teammate and you need to see her or him as a teammate. And I always say that she's not apart from the ministry that you have, because I believe coaching for Christians is a ministry. You should, you should view it not as a job, but as a ministry. And your wife or your spouse is not apart from your ministry. They are a part of your ministry. And if you have no ministry at home, then you, fa I don't care if you win state championships and all that other stuff. If you have no ministry at home, if your home is raggedy, then you have failed in the greatest assignment that God has given you. So I want to encourage you guys along those lines right there, that you're difference makers. But also I want to encourage us as individuals to recognize as believers, God has called us to be difference makers also, that you and I are difference makers. In Matthew verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 14 through 16, he says, he tells us, he says, hey, you're the salt of the earth. Then he goes on to say, you're the light of the world. Then he says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. That you and I, we are difference makers. God has called us to make a difference, not only in our home, but in our world, in our community. Wherever God puts you, we are difference makers. And you have to see yourself that way. I was, watch, I was watching film one time when I was in college, and the guy came in, and he said, man, what are you looking for when you look at film? I said, man, I'm looking for difference makers. Someone that will come in and will have an impact on the game that our winning and losing has a lot to do with his, or his presence on the field. We are difference makers, and that's how you have to see yourself. I always say, I'm not talking about positive thinking. I'm saying we got to get rid of our stinking thinking. We got to recognize this, man, I am a difference maker. And that's what God has called us to be. That's what he's uh, filled us with his Holy Spirit to be. So I just want to encourage you are difference makers, that you make a difference and that you recognize that. So as I want to talk to you real quick, I know I had some difference makers in my life, and I'm blessed. Here's the thing I know. God shapes each and every one of us for ministry. And I take the, the letters S-H-A-P-E, and I say shape, S stands for spiritual gift. H stands for heart. God gives you a heart for something, a passion, A, ability. God gives all of us ability. P, personality. And E, experience. So God has shaped each and every one of us for ministry. The spiritual gifts he's given us, what he's put on your heart, the ability he's given you, your personality, and your experience. And we take that experience, and that's how we, we serve God in ministry. And that's how we make a difference. So that's why when I stand before you tonight, I say, I can't teach you what I don't know. I can't give you what I don't have, and I can't lead you where I haven't gone. So I'm just going to share with you based on how God has shaped me and my experience. I talk about the giants in my life, the difference makers in my life. My dad was a difference maker in my life. My dad was my hero. I thank God that I didn't have to look outside the four walls of my home to, to look for a man. I looked right at my father, John Thomas Smith, and I saw 100% man. I said, man, I want to be like my dad. And after my dad, my dad passed away in 2009, but before he passed, how many times people would say, boy, you look like your dad. I said, I hope so. Not just physically, but the type of man that he was. 
My dad came to me and he asked me what was I going to do when I graduated from high school. I grew up in Youngstown and not, you know, growing up in Youngstown during the, the time we had the social unrest when it was really out there in your face, you know, with all the stuff that was going on with, you know, with race and all that other stuff. And my dad asked me, he said, son, what are you going to do when you graduate from high school? Because he let me know at the age of 18, my dad said, you got a few options. Go to college, get a job, go to the armed services or something. He said, but you need to know you're not going to be living here with us. So you will have to leave. So he said, what's your plan? And I gave my dad a great plan. I thought it was a great plan. I said, dad, here's what I'm going to do. Dad, I want to go and I'm going to get an apartment right down the street. It's about 10 minutes from you and mom. I want to rent an apartment right down the street. And dad, I want to work in the steel mill like you did for over 30 years. And dad, if I, if I just get a nice dependable car, that's all I want. My dad didn't like my plan. He, he didn't like my plan. Let me tell you, that apartment that I was talking about down the street, it was a public housing unit, the Kimmel Brooks. So, you know, my dad didn't like my plan. So here's what he did. He said, son, let's go for a ride. He got me in the car and he said, don't say a word. So we drive down by the Kimmel Brooks. That was the name of that housing uh, complex. And all he said to me was, son, don't buy the lie. Then we drove by another one of those public housing units on the side of town that I live, the McGuffey Terrace. My dad said, son, don't buy the lie. Then as we were leaving the east side of Youngstown, getting ready to drive to the south side, we drove by one of these public housing units. It was called the Plaza View Apartments. My, my dad said, son, don't buy the lie. He said, son, don't buy the lie that this is the only place where you can live. I had friends, teammates. I hung out in those places. I didn't think it was that bad. He said, son, don't buy the lie that this is the only place you can live. Then we drove to, we called it Boardman. It was, we call it the high rent district. We call it the vanilla suburbs. Three car garages, manicured lawns. My dad said, son, don't buy the lie that one day you can't live in a house like this. We go down to the steel mill where my dad worked and I would always get excited when we would go pick him up from work to see him walking down the stairs, see my dad. My dad said, son, don't buy the lie. This is the only place where you can work. He said, son, you can be a doctor, teacher, lawyer. He went through a whole list of things that I could be. And I don't say this to be in, in any way to be any political statement, but back in 1970, when my dad made the statement to me, you had to believe he had hope for what was possible. He said, son, don't bother lie that one day you or another black man can't be president of the United States. That's the kind of hope that my dad had. I was telling Terry the other night, as I was being raised in that atmosphere, my, one thing my father said, you will not allow racism to be an excuse for you to hate, nor will it be an excuse for you to fail. I love my dad. My dad said, son, don't bother lie. He saw that I had bought the lie that was being perpetuated by racism that was letting me know that I, as a young black man, this is as far as you can go. My dad said, don't buy the lie. My mom, she was a hero in my life. She was my shero. I get to college, you know, I'm glad that I got a scholarship to play football to go to Miami of Ohio. And Miami of Ohio at that time in 1972, this is the truth, it was it had to be 99% white or 98.9% .9 white. It was one of those. But I wanted to go to this school because the opportunity to get a, a great education, and I wanted to challenge myself academically, socially, and athletically. I was, had the opportunity to be the first black quarterback at that school. And so I went there. So as I'm getting ready to go to this school, we're packed, we got the car packed up, getting ready to drive to Oxford, Ohio, and my mom speaks. Car was packed up, she couldn't make the trip. So we're standing out, you know, if you've hugged your kids before they go away to college, it's emotional and all that other stuff. And mom is, she looks at me, she says, son, don't be the one. She says, son, there are gonna be people there that are gonna say the only reason why you're there is because of affirmative action or you're on a scholarship. She said, don't be the one. She said, son, there are gonna be people there that are gonna say, not only can't you learn, you don't want to learn. She said, son, don't be the one. She said, son, there are going to be people there that are going to say, not only can't you get along with other people, you can't even get along with your own people. 
Mom said, son, don't be the one. She said, son, don't be the one they're talking about when they make that statement. She said, you have an opportunity to validate negative stereotypes or to tear them down. You're going to make things better for those coming behind you or you're going to make things worse. My mom was letting me know that going to college was not only a privilege, but it was a responsibility that I had to make a difference, to make things better. I thank God for my mom. She said, son, don't be the one. And I just recognize the privilege that I have, but also the responsibility that comes along with it. The guy that led me to Christ, my dad said, don't buy the lie. Mom said, don't be the one. And Ken Hutcherson, a teammate of mine that led me to Christ, he said, don't buy the, he said, don't be a fool. This guy was a teammate of mine. I didn't know Jesus. And I'm a visual learner. And I had Christians talking to me about Christianity and what Jesus was all about. And these guys, their life was raggedy as all get out. You know, they were telling me the difference that Jesus could make in my life, and I didn't see Jesus making a difference in theirs. So, you know, guys would come up to me and talk that stuff to me. I said, man, get out of here. You, you're a hypocrite. You know, you don't live it. So I'm walking back to my room one night, my senior year in college. Now, the documentary that the Kendrick Brothers has out is called Show Me the Father. So this is the, this is the truth. So that movie, that came out in 2019 or 20, whenever it came out. I'm walking back to my dorm one night, my senior year, and I look up to the stars, and I say, God, I need somebody to show me you. I need somebody to show me. I get drafted in the second round by the Seattle Seahawks. I go out there. I'm the quarterback in college, get drafted as wide receiver. The first day we get there, they move me to running back. Head coach said, man, we're moving you to running back. I'm sitting in the lunchroom, and I'm thinking about I got my degree. Heck, I just wanted to be a high school teacher and coach. Man, maybe I'm going to ch chuck the deuces, and I'm going to go back to Youngstown and just start coaching high school ball. And I'm sitting there, and guys are walking in, and all these big guys are walking in, and I'm hoping they're offensive linemen. Man, I hope he's a lineman. This guy walks by. This guy walks by. Big black guy, Popeye arms. He walks by, and on the back of his T-shirt, it said, Hutch is going to Seattle to do God's battle. And I said, oh, no, man, here it is. I've come some 2,000 miles to run into another one of these so-called Christians. And, man, I went from, I, I kind of got angry about it. But God put it on my heart. I know that now. He said, watch him. You watch this guy. And that's what I did. I watched Ken Hutcherson. And there was something different about him. You knew he was a Christian, but he wasn't beating you over the head. with the He was just loving on you, encouraging you, man, going out there, having a good time. It, there's something different about this guy. We play our last preseason game back then in 1976. Don't even remember that. We, there were six preseason games in the NFL. We're playing our sixth preseason game. He gets clipped from behind, blows his knee out. They take him off the field. The word comes back. His career is over with. Man, and I mean, it hurt the whole team. So I'm thinking, okay, when the game's over, I'm going to run into the locker room, and man, I'm going to comfort Hutch the way he's comforting me. I'm going to be a friend of Hutch. I go in there, and there's all kinds of people standing around Hutch. Like I said, we don't make spiritual appointments, we keep them. Hutch and I had a spiritual appointment that day. For some reason, what happened was, all of a sudden, it was just Hutch and I in that room. He has ice packs on his knee, and he's sitting there with a smile on his face. And he's smiling, he says, Sherm, Sherm, I'm excited. He said, man, I'm excited to see what God has planned for my life. He said, you see, I'm a Christian. And nothing happens in my life that's not filtered through God's hands first. He said, man, I'm excited to see what God has planned for me. And he could see the look of bewilderment on my face. Like, I'm thinking he's on painkillers. Man, you know, I, I say one thing, you can't fake this. This is for real. And right there in that locker room, I said, please tell me more about Jesus Christ. He said, Sherm, God came to earth in the person of Jesus Christ for the purpose of dying in our place, to pay the penalty for our sins, that you and I can be declared not guilty in the court of heaven because the perfect righteousness of Christ is credited to those who believe. I didn't accept Christ at that moment right then, but I remember as we closed our conversation, dad said, don't buy the lie. Mom said, don't be the one. And Hutch said, Sherm, don't be a fool. Psalms 14.1 says, for the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And later on, I accepted Jesus Christ. 
difference makers in my life. My high school coach, Clip Coach Knox, he's the reason why I wanted to become a coach. So I want you coaches to know the importance that you make. After my dad and I had that conversation, and he, he messed up my plans for renting that apartment down the street and buying, you know, going to the steel mill, you know, so I'm, I'm, in, I'm sitting in class, and my high school football coach is up there teaching the health class. And I knew right then it hit me. I said, that's it, man. I want to be a coach. And I want to make a difference in the lives of students and players like Coach Knox has made in my life and in our school and in our community. I want to be like, I want to do what Coach Knox did. He was my inspiration. He came to a school that was a losing his school in, in Youngstown for sure and turned that program around. And he turned it around by that word that you hear today. He changed the culture of the school. He changed the culture with us. He started talking to us about having pride in yourself, pride in your community, respecting others. And it changed the entire community. When we started winning football games, our community changed. I said, man, that's what I want to be. Coaches, I want you to know, you make a difference. Somebody's looking at you, somebody said, man, that's what I want to be. I want to be a coach because I want to make a difference. So I thank God for Coach Knox, a difference maker in my life. And to shorten this thing up, I want you to know, besides my dad and those men that I named right there, I had 24 other men in my life that were my extended fathers. I called them extended fathers. From the time I was a little child till I graduated from high school, these 24 men were either a coach or a teacher in my life. And they affirmed everything that my dad said. They were, like I said, they were an extended father when I went to school. I got the same thing from them that I got from my dad. The only difference was they weren't responsible for clothing me and feeding me, but they affirmed and encouraged me, direct, they challenged me, disciplined me. So I thank God for those difference makers in my life. Those difference makers had a mindset. I'm gonna share this mindset, I shared it before, but there was a mindset they had, and I just want as our coaches to think about this, a mindset that I think that you should have that is, I could see this in, my, in the coaches, in their mindset. It was a mindset that I had as I coached for 32 years. The first mindset I had was, if you want God's best, do it God's way. If you want God's best, do it God's way. The second point I knew was, the power of respect is to never disrespect. So I, as a coach, and the way that my coaches coached us, they never disrespected us. I would tell my players when I would walk in the room, I will never disrespect you. I will coach you. I will correct you. But I will not disrespect you. I'm not calling anyone out of their name. I'm not putting my hands on anybody. I'm not cussing out anybody. I'm not doing any of that stuff. But I'm going to coach you. I'm going to correct you. But I'm not going to disrespect you. And that's the way we were treated by our coaches. So I knew for them, the power of respect is not to disrespect. They weren't disrespecting us, and we weren't going to disrespect them. The next thing, like I've said, the principle of mindset we had was, I would tell my guys, you may not be looking for a father, but I'm going to treat you like you're my son. And that's how I'm going to treat you. I'm going to treat you like you're my son. We also had the as-if principle. They had that as-if principle. The as-if principle says, if you treat a person the way they are, that's the way they'll stay. If you treat them the way you want them to be, that's what they'll try to become. Our coaches, those men in our lives, they didn't look at us like acorns. They saw us as future oak trees. And that's how they talked to us about the type of men that we could be. And that's what we have to do as coaches. Speak to them with, as the type of men and women that they can be if you're coaching ladies. The next thing they did, they led by example. They assumed that everybody was a visual learner. That day of don't do as I do, do as I say to do is over. We must lead by example. The next thing they did, they shared their scars. They shared their failures. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. Humility is not denying your strengths, but being honest about your failures. All of those battle scars that we got from our failures become beauty marks when someone learns from them. Share your failures. Let the guys know, man, I messed up. Tell them about the stuff that you did. Don't let guilt pride or shame keep you from sharing your stories. I recognize this in my life. Sharing my stuff with my players, my guys, it opened up the door. They came and talked to me. 
Instead of saying, oh, man, this guy is jacked up. They came and talked to me and said, Coach, you can relate to this. Coach, you understand some of this. So, man, you have to share your scars. Share your experiences. People learn more from your failures than they do from your success. Share your, share your failures. The next thing they knew was, those you enable now, you disable for later. They were going to hold us accountable. Because they know if I enable you now, I'm disabling you for later. They lovingly held us accountable. The other thing that they did was, in each of them, they knew that the step in the manhood was to understand that there must be a lion and a lamb in every man. The art is to be both and know when to be which. You're not all lion and you're not all lamb. There's a balance that we learn from, our, from these giants in my life. My dad, was a, he was great at that balance, lion and lamb. When I thought I was going to get the lion, I got the lamb. When I thought I was going to get the lamb, I got the lion. He just knew when and how to do it. And as coaches, that's, I think that has to be sort of our mindset as we, as we go through this process with our kids. So that was the mindset that they had as they brought us up. They brought us up with the mindset that they wanted, how they treated us. And now the mindset they wanted us to have, a couple of them were the same. When they spoke to us, they said, son, if you want God's best, do it God's way. Son, the power of respect is to never disrespect. But then they went off on a little, a different trail. They said, one thing about, you need to understand, all behavior is an attempt to reach a goal. Whether or not you're fully aware of what that goal is. It's called the law of sowing and reaping. They said, you're going, one day you're going to reap what you sow. So they let me know, everything you do, have you ever done something or somebody did something and you said to them, what did you think was going to happen? Well, they said to you, what did you think was going to happen? They were doing something. They didn't think it was going to lead to that. All behavior is an attempt to reach a goal. You may not be aware of what that goal is. The next one they give us, they said was, they taught us was, you need to know irresponsibility is never neutral. Someone becomes responsible for your irresponsibility. Someone becomes responsible for your irresponsibility. Those two points hit my life in November of 2017 when I got that phone call from Dylan McCullough telling me, you're my dad. The law of sowing and reaping, all behaviors and attempt to reach a goal. I always tell people when I found out that I had a son, I wasn't surprised that I had a son. I was surprised who it was. But my behavior was a true indication of if I was going to sow reap what I sold, then, yep, this, I shouldn't be surprised. And what bothered me the most was my irresponsibility, that someone else became responsible for my irresponsibility. All irresponsibility is never neutral. Someone becomes responsible for your irresponsibility. So they were giving us pointers like that. They were talking to us about goal setting. They would say, without a goal, you'll never start. But without discipline or commitment, you'll never finish. So they talked to us about setting goals. They talked to us about the friends. Be careful of the friends that you make. The Bible says, it says in, uh, what is it? Uh, Proverbs 12, 26. The righteous should choose their friends wisely, for the way of the wicked will lead you astray. Proverbs 13, 20, he who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of a fool will suffer harm. So they would tell us, man, watch your friends. They said to us, the one thing, they would make, ask a question, say, what is the one thing we've learned from history? The one thing we've learned from history is we haven't learned from history. They said, you got to learn from other people's failures and mistakes. Pay attention to it. Don't say that, that won't happen to me. So they gave us a mindset that they wanted us to have. And I remember the last one they told us, no one said it's going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. Life is not going to be easy. So that's the kind of mindset my coaches had and the mindset they wanted us to have. So I share that with you coaches. And so I'm going to end by asking you guys some questions, a few questions here. Why do you coach? What is your why? Whenever somebody would talk to me about wanting to coach, I would always ask that question, 
Why? Why do you want to coach? When I was interviewing for a job at the University of Illinois, Lou Tepper, that was the very first question in the interview. He said, why do you coach? Do you coach to make a living or do you coach to make a difference? Well, I know I was a high school coach. I know you're not doing it to make a living. Are you coaching to make a living? Do you coach to make a difference? There's what you get paid to do and there's what you are made to do. God said in his word in Ephesians chapter two, verse 10, he said, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works that he prepared ahead of time for us to do. You break that verse down. God is saying, you're God's workmanship. We are God produced, created in Christ Jesus. We're God powered to do good works. We're God purpose that he's prepared ahead of time for us to do. We're God provided. Coach to make a living, or you coach to make a difference. What you're made to do, what you're paid to do. Now, I'm going to tell you, I was fortunate in coaching. It, I got paid to do that. But I realized the stuff that I didn't like about coaching, in my mindset, this is what I'm getting paid to do. The stuff I loved, the, the relationships, talking to guys and all that stuff, I said, I, I like this. This is what I was made to do. And if you're a Christian, then you need to understand that coaching is not a job, it's a ministry. And you have to look at your job, this is my ministry, this is where God has put me. So, what is your coaching? Why do you coach? What's your why? The next question, what's the center of your life? What is the center of your life? What is that one thing in your life that touches, every, it touches everything? It touches every aspect of your life, the center of your life. Now, sometimes the center of your life can be a good thing. My kids are the center of my life. My wife is the center of my life. My husband is the center. Of, my job is the center of my life. My person, you know, my, my money. What is the center of your life? The thing that I would challenge you and warn you is this. If it's something you can lose, then you will always be insecure because you'll be afraid of losing it and you'll do whatever it takes to keep it. If winning is the center of your life, you'll do whatever it takes to win. What's the center of your life? What is that thing that you have in your life that, man, this touches everything? And there's only one thing that God wants to be the center of a Christian's life and that's him, period. Because it's something we can't lose. What is the character of your life? question is, what kind of person are you? What are your values? What's important to you? You stand for something or you'll fall for anything. Man, what do you stand for? What are your values? What's your character? And if you're not the person that you want to be, realize this. You can't be who you are and who you want to be at the same time. What's the character of your life? What are your values? Our top three for a believer should be integrity, humility, generosity. Paul was writing to Titus in chapter two, verse six, and he said, verse six through eight, he says, encourage young men to be self-controlled. In everything, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot, that cannot be condemned, so that those who oppose you will be ashamed because they have nothing evil to say about us. What's the character of your life? What's the communication of your life? What does your life say? Understand this. What you do speaks so loud, people can't hear a word you're saying. It's what you do that matters, not what you say. If people like what they see, they might believe what you say. What does your life communicate? What's the contribution of your life? 
What will be your legacy? What are you going to be remembered by? What do you want to be remembered by? I would always think of the times that we were co uh, coaching out there in Seattle on Lake Washington, man, beautiful. The, the camp where we had our practice field was beautiful, Lake Washington, blue skies. And we would come out there for evening pra afternoon practice, and you would see a jet stream. Man, it'd, be, it'd go a long way. The jet wasn't there, but evidence that the jet was there was the jet stream. You and I, we're going to leave a jet stream. What is your jet stream going to be? It's not the duration of your life that counts. It's the donation of your life that counts. What are you going to leave when you're gone? Next question. When people look at you, what do they see? When they look at you, what do they see? What do you want them to see? When they look at you. God said, like I said in Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. When people look at you, what do they see? And then the last one, and I'll leave you with this question with a story. I was coaching with the Seattle Seahawks. We're playing the Washington at that time, the Washington Redskins, in a playoff game. My son and my granddaughter drove up from North Carolina to come to D.C. to see the game. I took them out to dinner, just like Terry took us out to dinner last night. I took them out to dinner. But the problem I had, Terry, was is the entrees were $30, and when they brought the food out, it was like, I said, I didn't order the kitty meal, did I? You know, man, wh where's the food at? Are you bringing some more food? Is this the first serving? And the guy, no, this is it. And I'm sitting there, and I can't enjoy the food or the fellowship because I'm just ticked off because I didn't feel like I was getting what I paid for. But I looked down the table, my son and my granddaughter and a friend of theirs, they have no problem. Their head is down, and man, they're just going left and right with that food. They're enjoying all of it. Well, they didn't have to pay for it. I can understand, all right, they, they didn't have to pay for it, but I did. So, man, I'm sitting there, can't enjoy the food or the fellowship. And I think you all understand, right? You want to get what you pay for. We all, do we all agree with that? We want to get what we pay for. God puts it on my heart. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 19 through 20. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit that you receive from God, and you've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body and your spirit, which are his. And the question that God put on my heart is I'm over here jacked up about this food meal. The question he put on my heart, and I want to ask you that question, if you're a believer, is Jesus getting what he paid for? Is he getting what he paid for? Are we making the difference that we're supposed to make? And we say, Lord, you, I want you to get what you paid for. You died for me. You died in my place to pay the penalty for my sins. I want you to get what you paid for. That should be our desire as we live to make a, a difference for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So coaches, spouses, believers in Christ, I just want you to know we're difference makers. We're a child of the King. And God has left us here to make a difference, to be salt and to be light. And you know when you add salt to something, it makes a difference. And light exposes the things in darkness. What is important to you? What do you value? Because if you don't know what you value, how can you stand for it? What's important to you? I know the time has gone by. I, I said to Terry, questions about the story. I said I would open it. If you want to ask any questions that you have about the story or anything I said, man, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. If you have no questions, I don't feel bad about that either. I just want, you, I don't want you to walk away. Man, I wonder about this. So if anyone has any question about the story itself, because I know the story is wild, 
you know. Um, but be happy to answer any questions that you have about that and also anything else. So, Terry, I'll do that. And then are you going to come up or you want me to end it? Hayden, you're coming up. Okay. So any questions? Good. Good? Thanks, guys. <laughs> All right, my buddy. Thank you, Coach. Thank Appreciate you. you. Hey, thanks again so much for being here tonight. Uh, man, our heart in FCA is to help equip you to grow in your faith, but also to lead your team spiritually lead your family spiritually. So we have all kinds of resources for you. We have some coaches Bibles over there. If you don't have a coach's Bible, it has 365 days a week devotional in the back written by coaches for coaches. Uh, we have all other kinds of resources to help you grow in your faith. We also have a curriculum called E3, Engage, Equip, Empower, where you can be in a discipleship relationship with someone and they can help you grow in your faith. So if you're interested in that, come talk to one of us uh, about that. Uh, also, all that stuff on the table, by the way, is y'all's. So if you see something over there, please go uh, take that. We have some food left over here. They're prepared to take some to go, uh, if you'd like to take it to go. And also, you came tonight and got to hear how awesome Sherman is. So come tomorrow night and bring your team or invite someone, bring some of your players. Um, to let him let it so you can come hear him tomorrow night uh, at the Bozier Civic Center. Food lines will open at six. Program will start at six thirty. So y'all come and check that out uh, tomorrow night. Let me pray for y'all, and then we'll uh, dismiss here. Lord, I just uh, God, I thank you uh, for this day, Lord. I just thank you for each one here, and Lord, the calling that you placed on their life first is just as followers of you, but also. Lord, as uh, the ministry that you've called them to. And Lord, we know the words of Billy Graham that a coach will impact more young people in a year than the average person will in a lifetime. And they're making differences in the lives of those that they coach and lead. And I pray, God, that you guide, direct, and lead everything that they say so that it would bring honor and glory to you. I pray for their families, Lord. I pray you bless them, Lord. I pray that, God, you provide every one of their needs, Lord. And I just pray that, God, they look to you and we were all encouraged by something that was said tonight and go and leave here different uh, than the way that we came in, Lord, just as um, we mentioned earlier. So, God, I pray that and I ask that in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all.